Hey there, everybody. It's Mike Delisio, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Philosophia Floating World, coming from designers Madeline and Joseph Adams and publisher Cogito Ergo Meeple. Philosophia Floating World is a game that utilizes an interesting card-driven action uh, system, and uh, I'll kind of show you how the game works over there on the table, then we'll come back here, and I'll let you know what I think about it. Okay, here we see Philosophia Floating World uh, partially set up. In the game, you are going to be playing as a particular character, and in this case, I just chose the Kabuki actor to show off. They've got their little icon here, and you'd have a miniature on the board that represents your character, and it also tells you where it starts, in this case, Nagasaki, and so that's where I've got my character on the board. They're also going to have their own unique deck of cards, and you can tell that it's their deck because it has their symbol here, on the bottom center of the card. All right, in the game, you are trying to win by one of two possible winning conditions. Either you are trying to get all four of these tokens or get two of those four tokens and discover the secret location of another character that's denoted by this. So either getting these four tokens or any two of those four and discovering the hidden location of another player, and I'll explain how that works here in a moment. Generally speaking, this is a simultaneous play game where everything is kind of happening at the same time, and any conflicts that might occur timing-wise are going to be resolved by this influence track right up there. The flow of the game is such that each uh, round is going to be made up of three phases. You've got the draw phase, the collect phase, and the action phase. And so let me just talk a little bit about all three of those three phases. Okay, so in the draw phase, what's gonna happen is you are gonna take the top six cards from your deck, and you're gonna hand them to the player on your left. You would also be gathering cards from the player to your right, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna take those six cards, I'm using my own deck, but it doesn't really matter. You're gonna take those six cards, and you're going to split them into two different piles one a pile of two, one a pile of three, and the remaining card is going to be discarded. So you are choosing for the uh, person on your uh, right, you're going to be choosing one of these cards that are going to be discarded, they're not going to have access to it, and then they're going to have the choice of either the two or the three that you split them in. And so generally speaking, you're going to try to set it up so that you are putting the more powerful actions or the actions that you think they may, they may need more into that stack of two, usually, uh, because you don't want to give them more, um, more abilities than they might otherwise have or more resources than, than they might already have. So that is the draw phase. You take the top six, split them into a stack of two or and three, and then the last remaining card would get discarded. That's all you do during the draw phase. Next up comes the collect phase, and what you're going to do there is look at the bottom left of whichever stack you chose. So let's say that I was given this stack of two and this stack of three, and that sixth card had been discarded. Of these, let's say I'd chosen this stack of three. You're going to look on the bottom left, and it's going to show you what resources that you are going to gather. So in this case, I would get a coin, and I would get a gear, all right? And these are resources that I have access to. I would place them onto my player board. Every player has a player board as well, uh, and you have access to those resources. Some other resources you may be able to get are these time tokens, and what time tokens allow you to, to do is cover up an, an available action. I just dropped it. Uh, cover up an available action on your player board that you could, in the next phase, use to remove it and take the action that it is covering. So, generally speaking, money, time tokens, these cogs, which are another resource, you're going to collect those during the collect phase. Then finally, you're going to do the action phase, where you are going to take those same cards that you had, you used them a moment ago to collect resources, and then you're going to take actions. And those are going to be on the right side, the bottom right side of the card. And there are a number of different actions that you can take. Um, 
Primarily, you'll either you'll get these actions by these icons down here, as I said, but also remember that if you had placed a time token on an action earlier, you would also have access to that. And again, a reminder that all of this is being done simultaneously. Everyone are take, is taking these actions at the same time, and again, timing issues would be resolved by using that influence track that's there towards the top right of the board. All right, and so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about these actions and how they work, because these are the things you need to do to gain these tokens to, of course, win the game, which is what you're trying to do. All right, so the first thing is, let's look here is, this is a move action, and this is very simple. You can simply move on these dotted lines on the board. The number of spaces you can move is denoted by the number of arrows, so this would be a movement of one. If you had access to the move uh, action on your player board, that's moving up to three, all right? So you just move from one space to another on the board. Moving is very simple. Another action you'll be taking throughout the game is to buy a season card, which is denoted by this symbol down here. This is essentially going to be adding to your deck of cards. And you would look at this market up here, which is made up of five cards, and you would purchase one of these cards. And the cost is in the upper left. Now, you might buy a card like this, which has a permanent symbol here, which means that it is not necessarily added to your deck, but it becomes a permanent ability that you can do once per round, uh, collecting uh, resources, things along those lines or you may get one of these cards that are gonna be similar to your starting cards that give you something during the collect phase and something during the action phase. So when you buy these, they go into your discard and in typical deck building faction, when you have to shuffle up, they're gonna get added to your deck. Another action you're gonna to wanna to take is a build action. This is something that is gonna directly lead to a win condition. Um, in that, you are gonna use the build action to build either a Shinto Shrine or a Pagoda. The costs are down here. When you do that, uh, you're gonna be working towards getting these tokens. So the Pagoda, you need to build one to be able to get that, that uh, associated token here. And the Shrines, you start with three on your board at the beginning of the game. And if you build all three of those, then you get another one of those tokens. When you build a shrine, you're going to take it from your player board. I've got them off to the side here, but they'd be on your board. And you're going to place it into the spot that is next to where your character is. Obviously, if that was already taken by a different character, you would have to move to a new spot before you can build that shrine. All right, another action you're going to probably be doing is going to the shop and buying equipment. The costs are along here. Here's the market. Uh, sometimes they're going to be symbols that you might need for a set collection for another um, win condition I'll talk about in a moment. They may also be um, weapons that you use to fight monsters, which we'll talk about here in a moment as well. So on your player boards, you also have some actions that are not associated out here uh, on the cards I showed you. Here's another action you could take where you're going to take the rightmost card from this market. And really what you're doing here is you're looking for set collection. You're trying to get one of all of the symbols. If you do so, that's gonna get you another one of those tokens, again, towards uh, working towards your uh, final winning condition. When you fight monsters, it's a little bit different in that you have to be in one of the two monster fighting locations. So let's say I moved there, oops, and now I'm in a situation where I can fight a monster. What you're gonna do is you're gonna flip over the top card of the monster deck, you're gonna look at the bottom and see what they need to be defeated. In this case, two specific weapons and a time token would have to be spent to defeat this monster, all right? Which is another winning condition towards the end game is fighting monsters, all right? Um, as it says here, if you manage to defeat a monster, you get the Bushido token, all right? So again, you're all working towards either all four of these or two of them and discovering the secret location where another character is. Well, secret location is gonna be something that's set up at the beginning of the game. At the beginning of the game, there are location tiles that represent the locations on the board. You're gonna choose two of them at random. One of them you're gonna to choose to be your secret location, sorry, and the other you're gonna to choose to be your decoy. And so in this case, my secret location was Kyoto. If someone had gone to Kyoto and done a search, I would have to reveal that they had found my secret location. Okay, so the search is another action you can take that is right up here. So you're gonna to continue to do this throughout the game, going through those three phases where you are drawing your cards, you're passing them to your neighbor, um, 
getting the, the split of three and two, one getting discarded, and then doing simultaneous actions on the board, trying to gain the resources and tokens you need to be able to get either the four main winning condition tokens or two of them and discovering the secret location of a different player. That's how you play it. In a nutshell, there are some things I've left out, but let's head over and I'll let you know what I think. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea on how Philosophia Floating World plays out. Uh, the first thing I want to do is talk about some benchmarks, some high-level ideas that kind of determine how uh, likely I am to get a game off the shelf. The first thing is the rules. Um, and this was a rule book that I had some issues with. I, I don't feel that it was a great rule book altogether. Um, I did learn the game from the rule book, so it did the base level of what you would expect from a rule book, which is being able to learn the game. However, it was very uh, difficult to read graphically. It, would, it, it, it felt like it needed better organization. It needed better kind of just actual design graphically. It was just big blocks of text. Uh, it, it was not pleasant for me to read. I had a really hard time kind of getting through and finding where one section ended and the next began. Uh, it, it just, I, I felt like it was not organized terrifically well. Um, that was my main concern with it. I could learn the game from it, and so that's important to say. I mean, uh, when, when a rule book is truly, truly bad is when you cannot learn the game from the book. So I was able to learn it, even though I found it unattractive to look at. I wish there would have been more, you know, graphic examples of particular things, um, and I wish that the, the text had been more clear, legible, easy to read. Um, so it, it was mostly a graphical, organizational issues I had with the rule book. I was able to learn the game from it. Uh, set up and tear down is the other thing I like to talk about, and in the case of Philosophia Floating World, it was it's not a bad amount of time to set the game up and, and tear it down. There's you know a fair amount of uh, components, but uh, nothing that was too arduous. I feel like the amount of time that you take setting up the game is commensurate with the amount of time that you're playing, the experience that you get. The, the, the only time I really have an issue with this is when it seems like it takes you almost as long to set up the game as it does to play it, and that is not the case here. So set up and tear down is fine. The other thing I like to do is talk about art and components, and first I'll talk about uh, things I liked, and then some things that did not work as well for me. Uh, first of all, the, the minis I thought were fine. I mean, do you need minis in a game like this? Not necessarily, but they're, they're nice. There's not that many of them. Uh, I'm not a painter, but I'm sure that they would look better if they had been painted, but uh, they, they, they serve the purpose just fine. I thought that the art qual or excuse me, the card quality is good, uh, good, good quality cards, and, and you need that because there's a fair bit of shuffling and card handling that goes on. There's actually quite a bit of card handling that goes on, and I feel like you don't need to sleeve these cards. They're going to hold up well to uh, repeated plays. I do like the art on the uh, cards as well. Um, obviously, that's going to be a big selling point, I think, in this game, is going to be the look of the, uh, of the aesthetics, the overall aesthetic of the game. Uh, so I thought that the art quality uh, was very nice on the cards, and the, co the quality of the cardboard board components, pardon me, were also quite good. Good, thick, uh, quality cardboard components. On the negative side was that the board was kind of messy and cluttered looking to me. It, it was not an attractive board. I don't know if it's just the, the graphic design uh, or, the, or the, 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 the way they chose to kind of present it out there, but it just did not look very attractive. It wasn't terribly inviting uh, to me. I felt like with the beautiful art that was on display, the board could have done a better job of framing that, whereas the board, to me, just, again, looked kind of messy. The connecting paths from the different cities, uh, it just it didn't look good. I, 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 it's hard to quantify when you're discussing art, uh, why something works and doesn't work, but the words that came to mind when I was playing this game and looking at it the first time was cluttered and messy, and those aren't necessarily positive words. Um, the other thing is, while I praised the art on the cards, and I do like the art on the cards, um, it's not a consistent look throughout. So you've got some cards that are uh, vertically oriented and some cards that are horizontally oriented. And, you know, understandably, when you're going to be taking art from different kind of artists and different periods, um, it's not going to have a completely consistent look, but it looked especially kind of disjointed to me. 
Uh, it, it did not have a cohesive kind of feel throughout the art in the game. And so that was something that I did take note of. Overall game impressions. Okay, again, a couple of things that I did like and then some things that did not work as well for me. So to me, the, the biggest positive in this game is the draw phase where you're going to take those six cards, one of them gets discarded, the, then you split them into three and two and you give that to, to your neighbor. I really, really like that. It's a kind of a, a slick implementation of the I split, you choose mecha uh, mechanism, but here it's being done to drive the actions for your round. And so I really like that feeling because not only are you kind of thinking about your turn, you're also influencing what other people can do at the table as well. And I think that that's a really nice interaction point. Uh, I, I, that's my favorite aspect of the game by far, is that draw phase, that kind of the, the riff on I split you choose. I also like the idea of the time tokens, that resource that allows you to kind of use the uh, actions on your player board. It, it's, a, it's a really nice way to kind of also add to the actions that you'll be taking from those cards because, you know, if you get those time tokens, they, they basically give you a little more flexibility. And so I thought that that was a pretty slick uh, use of uh, th those tokens as well. Now, things that did not work well for me, and unfortunately there were quite a few. The big thing is that this game is uh, touted as a simultaneous game, where, where you're taking turns during the action phase simultaneously. It, to me, it was a mess. It, it really, it, it just was a mess. Um, I have to assume that they chose to go that direction, the simultaneously, uh, simultaneous action selection uh, method, because it would be a time saver. And I'm, I'm sure it is a time saver, uh, all told, because this has a, a larger player count possibility. I don't think that the time that's saved makes up for what a mess it is to try to take these actions on a shared board. It's not a speed game, it's not a real-time game, but sometimes it kind of felt like that where you were like having to kind of like negotiate where other people were going and when they were going and and it just to me did not work that influence track is supposed to break those ties again it just felt like a mess and um, I don't think that the benefit you get from saving time is outweighed by the the just messiness of the experience for the people around the table um, I will mention that they have in the back of the rule book a variant to have a, a turn-taking variant. That's the, if I were going to play this game again, that's the only way I would play it. Now, I have played the game both ways. I've played it in the turn-taking variant, and I've played it in the simultaneous play variant. Uh, I would never choose the simultaneous uh, play variant, but that is the kind of base rules. That's the way the game is presented to you as, as a simultaneous play game. I think that they're doing a huge disservice by doing that because I don't think, in my experience, uh, that that is the optimal way to play the game. The monster hunting action, I think, is a, a huge problem. It's an exercise in frustration because what you're doing is you are essentially going to one of these two spots on the board and you're flipping over a card. It's a top deck situation. What does this monster need to be defeated? No idea. Did I get the right tools and, 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 uh, or, or weapons? No clue. The only way to kind of mitigate that is to just try to get as much of every resource as you can and hope you flip over a card. It's not a very satisfying thing at all. It feels completely random and arbitrary and very, very frustrating. And since that is one of the potential winning conditions, it's kind of important. So uh, that was a big miss for me as well. The searching action also feels almost completely random, especially early in the game. As the game goes on, you get a little bit more information. But taking that search action, again, which is tied into one of the winning conditions, if you can find somebody's secret location, now you only have to get two of the tokens instead of four. It just, it, it, again, it, it feels a bit too random, just like the monster hunting does. It, it, it removes a feeling of agency. You kind of feel like you're taking a shot in the dark and hoping for the best. Another big issue that I have is that during the, this was a Kickstarter uh, um, campaign. This game was funded through Kickstarter. And after it had been uh, received by players, myself included, uh, there was an update, a Kickstarter update that the uh, publishers released where they said, hey, 
here are some different variant ideas that uh, that we've come up with and some that have been suggested on Board Game Geek from, from people. We've been trying them out and we think that they're really good. Well, I looked at them and I feel like all of them are much better than what was presented in the base game. One of them was trying to mitigate that monster action that I talked about, where you have two of the monster cards that are face up to the side of the board, so you have some idea of what you're working on. Yes, that's 100% better. Um, my question is, why wasn't that found during playtesting? If you've come up, if you've had kind of crowdfunded development, I find that's a problem. And, and maybe I'm being a little bit too strong with that, but it feels like there was a lack of development in this game. When you have, within a month of a game being released, all of these kind of different variants and patches and fixes, that to me spells a game that probably needed more time in development. And, and so that's my overall kind of feeling is that it's a little frustrating because I feel like somewhere in here is a good game. Somewhere in here is a game that I would like to play because I really love, again, that draw phase, that, that action selection kind of system. That to me is great. And there are other aspects of the game that I think are cool too, but it just didn't feel like it had enough time to fine, to, to, to fine tune it, to shave off the rough edges. It needed more development in my opinion. And so as the game is presented now, which is you know simultaneous play game without any of these other variants, I'm giving the game a 4 out of 10. It does not work for me. It's not a game that I could recommend. I feel like all of the ways that you need to improve the game should have been there from the beginning. And so I can, you know, I'm really reviewing the game as it came in the box, as most people are going to, uh, you know, interact with it. You can't assume that people are going to jump on to, to BGG and see these different variants. And, you know, maybe they're not going to be reading the, the uh, Kickstarter update email. So rating the game in the box, it's a 4 out of 10. I feel like there's another game somewhere hiding in there, but uh, I'm not sure that people are going to be willing to put in the work to find it. All right, well... That's it for me. This is Mike Delicio signing off from Dice Tower Headquarters.